There once was a town high in the Alps that straddled the banks of a beautiful stream. The stream was fed by springs that were as old as the earth and as deep as the sea. The water was clear like crystal. Children laughed and played beside it. Swans and geese swam on it. You could see the rocks and the sand and the rainbow trout that swarmed at the bottom of the stream. High in the hills, far beyond anybody's sight, lived an old man who served as kind of keeper of the stream. He had been hired so long ago that now no one could remember a time when he wasn't there. He would travel from one spring to another in the hills, removing branches or fallen leaves or debris that might pollute the water. But his work was unseen. One year, the town council decided they had better things to do with their money. Nobody supervised the old man anyhow. They had roads to repair and taxes to collect, services to offer, and giving money to an unseen stream cleaner had become a luxury they could no longer afford. So the old man left his post. High in the mountains, the springs went untended. Twigs and branches and worse muddied the liquid flow. Mud and silt compacted the creek bed. Farm waste turned parts of the creek into stagnant bogs. For a time, nobody in the village noticed. But after a while, the water was not the same. It began to look brackish. The swans flew away to live somewhere else. It no longer had that crisp scent that drew children to play by it. Some in the town began to grow ill. Everybody noticed the loss of sparkling beauty that used to flow between the banks of the stream that fed the town. You see, the life of the village depended on the stream, and the life of the stream depended on the keeper. So the city council reconvened, the money was found, the old man was rehired. After yet another time, the springs were cleaned, the stream was pure, and children played again on its banks. And illness was replaced by health. The swans came home. The village came back to life. The life of the village depends on the health of the stream. The stream is your soul, and you are the keeper. You probably know the prayer by heart. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. But really, if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take, is it just me, or are these words a little scary to teach a seven-year-old to pray alone, in the dark? Depending on what they really mean, they may be scary words for us adults to pray as well. Furthermore, if we die before we wake, and God does in fact take our souls, what exactly is he taking? A study was done once in which hundreds of church attenders were asked this very question. And while most of them believed that they did in fact know what the term soul meant, when asked to explain it, they just couldn't do it. It's a really interesting word, soul. It may be like Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart's description of obscenity. It may be hard to define, but I know it when I see it. How do we define soul, really? Do we even try? Like obscenity, is it something that we can't quite put into words, but when we see it, when we sense it, we'll know that's it? I gotta say, I'm really not satisfied with that approach. For decades, I've been dissatisfied with that approach, which is why I've been on this years-long scavenger hunt of sorts, trying to pick up pieces of understanding about the human soul. What is it? What my soul is? consists of? Why does it matter if it does matter? And whether it's doing okay? Maybe you have been on a similar hunt. We're all curious about the soul, not just because we're eager to make sense of that ominous childhood prayer, but for another reason too. We're curious about the soul because we know, we know at a deep level, we know at a soulish level, that something holds our lives together. My meanness and your you-ness. There's something that makes it cohere, that holds it together. See, all of us have 
kind of an outer life, but then an inner life. My outer self is the public visible me. My accomplishments, my work, my reputation, they're all there in that outer life. Years ago, I was working at a church which, in the little world of my own profession, was quite large and visible. Case in point, there were more people on staff at that church than there were attenders at the church I had previously worked at. And suddenly, because I was working there, people sought out my opinion more. They assumed I was smarter than I was. They invited me to speak at their events. My outer world was now larger and busier and more complex than ever before. But significantly, my inner world had not grown at all. My inner life, where my secret thoughts and my hopes and my wishes live, no one has direct access to. My inner life does not win applause. And because my inner life is largely invisible, it is infinitely easier to neglect. I kind of thought that such a large change in my outer world would bring a quick upgrade to my inner world. More fulfillment, more gratification, more peace, more sense of significance maybe. Instead, the very busyness, the very complexity of that outer world was almost like a private blizzard. Kind of made it hard to navigate my internal world clearly. It's hard to drive in a snowstorm. The storm almost always wins. More than 20 years ago, I met a teacher, a philosophy professor, and a lover of God who would become a very dear friend. He had written a book, and it was called The Spirit of the Disciplines, that was profoundly influential on my life. And I wrote to him, his name was Dallas Willard, and explained how much I appreciated his book. And very much to my surprise, he wrote back. This was like way before Twitter. Things like that didn't happen much. And more amazing still, I learned that he lived just a few miles away from where I lived in Southern California. And to complete my surprise, he invited me to drop by his house sometime. He was a very prominent person in the circles that I ran in. And to tell the truth, I kind of hoped maybe his prominence would rub off on me, maybe make me a little bit more prominent too. I found Dallas's home tucked behind kind of a ramshackle picket fence in a little place called Box Canyon near the San Fernando Valley. He came to the door to greet me and said, Hello, Brother John. I will never forget that first conversation. I've never been with somebody who could so focus in on another person. I remember that was in the day before answering machines. The phone would ring and Dallas would act as if he hadn't heard it. I was thinking, you know, you're not allowed to do that because whoever he was with, it really was as though he had nothing to do but just be present with you. So many years later, when I had this kind of crisis between my inner life and my outer life, Dallas was the first person that I wanted to talk to about it. And I asked him, why is it that it seems like so many great things are going on in my outer world and I'm having chances to contribute and grow and so on, but there hasn't been a big change in my inner life. And we had a long conversation about the subject that was maybe most dear and near to Dallas's heart, and that is the soul. He said, what matters most, what it is that marks your existence, the really deep reason why human life matters so much is because of this tiny, fragile, vulnerable, precious thing about you called your soul. You are not just a self. You are a soul. You're a soul made by God, made for God, and made to need God, made to run on God, which means that you are not made to be self-sufficient. And this was a remarkable, in some ways very hopeful, in some ways kind of disturbing conversation for me. I read one time in a medical journal that in the 20th century, people who lived in each generation were three times more likely to experience depression than people in the generation before them. In other words, despite the rise of the mental health profession, people are becoming increasingly vulnerable to depression. Why? One brilliant psychologist has a theory that it's because we have replaced community, society, church, faith with a tiny little unit that cannot bear the weight of meaning. We replaced all these larger entities with the self. Now we're all about the self. We revolve our lives around ourselves which is not okay, because we are more than a self. We are a soul. And because the more obsessed with self we are, the more we can neglect our soul. 
I can prove it to you. If you're stressed out, what should you learn to take care of? Well, we tell you, yourself. If you're going to go on a job interview or an audition, who should you believe in? We will say, yourself. If you're not getting your own way, who are you supposed to stand up for? Yourself. If you're going on a date, who are you supposed to be? Yourself. If you're headed to the tattoo parlor, who are you supposed to express? You got it. Yourself. Minor point of clarification here. What if yourself is a train wreck? What do you do then? See, self, as we think about it, is a standalone do-it-yourself unit. While the soul reminds us we were not made for ourselves or by ourselves, the soul always exists before God. Sometimes I'll watch the sunset at the beach while I smell the salt water and listen to the crashing surf. Standing there, on a ledge overlooking the Big Sur, overlooking a mountain range, I experienced this enormous combination of joy and humility and awe. There is a depth to those moments that goes beyond what the body can apprehend alone. There is a depth to those moments that is reachable only by way of the soul. Here's the deal. Your soul connects your thoughts, your sensations, your emotions, your will, and integrates them into an entire being. You can send that message to other persons. You can communicate with God. You can say wow to the universe. That is the soul at work. Dallas was a keeper of the stream, a professor of the soul. He used to say, anytime you want to care for something, you have to understand it, whether it's a Beagle or a BMW. Now, if a car is tuned and fueled and oiled and aligned, it's capable of doing amazing things. But if you don't understand its parts and how those parts work together, you can see the result. He went on to make this obvious connection. He said it's terribly important to understand the parts of the human being, of the person. Each part must be healthy and working as God intended it to. And that makes a healthy soul. If your soul is healthy, no external circumstance can destroy your life. If your soul is unhealthy, no external circumstance can redeem it. I told him that even though I work at a church, even though soul saving is like kind of what I'm supposed to get paid to do, I wasn't sure exactly how to define or explain or care for my soul. And Dallas was not at all shocked by this. Uh, one time we were at a restaurant and he took out a napkin and he carefully drew a series of concentric circles. He said, I want to talk about the parts of the person, maybe what we might call the anatomy of the person. The innermost circle, he said, is the human will, the capacity to choose, where we're able to say yes or no to this or that. The will, he said, is what makes you a person and not a thing. It's what the Bible talks about when it says that God made human beings to exercise dominion. Now, exercising dominion is an act of the will. The will, the ability to choose, is something we greatly treasure in ourselves and others. But the will also is extremely limited, which is why people eat molten chocolate cake when they know they're not supposed to. And why, on more than one occasion, speaking personally, I've had not one piece but two. The point that Dallas was making, that even I could understand was, if we try to improve our lives ourselves by sheer willpower, we will exhaust ourselves and we'll exhaust everybody else we know. Dallas went on. The second circle, he said, represents the mind. Dallas said in the ancient world, the mind referred to both a person's feelings and their thoughts. By thoughts, he said, I mean all the ways that somebody is conscious of things. The Apostle Paul says, the mind of the sinful person is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind wants to be at peace. My mind wants peace. It was craving peace all those years ago, which is why I had come to see Dallas. You always have to think you have to be someplace or be somebody else or accomplish something more to find peace, Dallas would say. But it's right here. God has yet to bless anybody except where they actually are. And I'll never forget that line. God has yet to bless anybody except where they actually are. Peace is ours for the having.
right here, right now, in a transformed mind. Then there was a third circle. Dallas said, this one represents the body. He would say, our bodies are kind of like our little power packs. We couldn't be us without them. They are filled with all kinds of appetites and with all kinds of habits. In fact, in a way, we can outsource much of our behavior from tying our shoelaces to driving a car to our bodies so that our wills and our minds don't have to be occupied with things like driving a car or tying shoelaces. But they are not the whole story. We are not just the stuff that our bodies are made of. He drew another circle. And this one, he said, represents the soul. He went on to explain that the soul is what seeks harmony. The soul is what connects. The soul is what integrates all of our different parts into a single person. And that's why integrity is such a deep soul word. The human soul is what integrates our wills and our minds, our thoughts and feelings, and our bodies into an integral person, into a whole person. A healthy soul is an integrated soul, Della said, and an unhealthy soul is a disintegrated one. And when we're dealing with a disintegrated soul, then we have to come to grips with sin. See, Jesus understood all of this. Jesus once said that it is no use to gain the whole world if it means that we lose our soul. Now, I used to think what that meant was it doesn't do any good to get you know, rich and have all kinds of pleasure if you end up going to hell. That's not the main point Jesus is making. What Jesus is saying is really a diagnostic um, expression. I can get everything I want to, but if my ability to integrate my will and my mind and my body have been lost, no circumstance in the world can bring me lasting joy, let alone meaning before God. To lose my soul, see, means that I no longer have a healthy center that organizes and guides my life. I'm like a car without a steering wheel. Doesn't matter how fast I go, I'm a crash waiting to happen. Um, in the Midwest where I grew up, farmers back in the old days used to run a rope from their house to the barn at the first sight of a blizzard. They knew stories of people who had died in their own yards during a whiteout because they couldn't find their way home. One author puts it like this, the blizzard of the world is the fear and frenzy and deceit and indifference to the suffering of others that separates us from our own souls and our moral bearings. What we need, he said, is a rope from the back door to the barn so we can find our way home again. When we catch sight of the soul, we can survive the blizzard without losing our hope or our way. Now, you don't even have to believe the Bible to see the importance of the soul or its existence. Just look around you or maybe even inside you. A mom struggles to create the perfect home. Her husband maybe doesn't help much. She doesn't tell him how much she resents it, mostly because she's always been kind of afraid of conflict. She's angry at her children for not being perfect, for not getting on track to get into the right school, for not making her look good as a mom. She's angry at her body for aging. Feeling attractive has been the one unforced sense of worth in her life and it's ebbing away. She withdraws. She drinks a little too much. She gossips with some of her friends about some of her other friends. She finds a way to fill time by escapist behavior. She thinks that her problem is her husband or her kids or her age or her body, but it's not. It's her soul. And so it is with every one of us. See, every one of us fights this battle where we think thoughts that are unworthy of our lives. We end up desiring things. There's a conflict between what we choose or what our habits are and what we see our deepest values are. And all of this disintegrates our lives at the deepest level. This is what Jesus is getting at when he said, gaining the outside world does not help if you lose your soul in the process. Look at me, look at you, look at everybody doing the human thing. We live on the planet of lost souls. This is the great human crisis. And the only way to address this is to recognize the existence of the soul. This is 
the most important thing I have to say, you have a soul. And for you to have a soul that is healed, that is healthy, that is redeemed by God, matters more than the outcome of any circumstance in your world or your life. Your eternal destiny rests on the well-being of your soul. And only God can heal a soul. I said before, we're kind of like people trying to make it back home in a blizzard, holding on to that rope. What does that particular rope look like? Well, it's attending to the soul. Nothing more, nothing less. Years ago, during a particularly busy season of ministry, I called Dallas to ask him, what do I need to do to stay spiritually healthy? There was a long pause. With Dallas, there was always a long pause. And then he said, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. There was another long pause. And then I said, okay, Dallas, I got that one. Now, what else do I need to do? Because I don't have a lot of time and I want to cram in as much wisdom as I possibly can. And there was another long pause. And then he said, there is nothing else. He said, hurry is the great enemy of our souls in our day. He said, now there's a big difference between being busy and being hurried. Being busy is mostly a condition of our outer world. It's having many things to do. Being hurried is a problem of the soul. It's being so preoccupied with myself and what myself has to do that I am no longer able to be fully present with God and fully present with you. And the thing about Dallas, the wonderful, miraculous thing about my friend Dallas is he lived from his soul so deeply in the presence of God that when anybody was with him, they felt their soul come to life. One guy that I know used to say about Dallas, I would like to live in his time zone. Dallas said, there is no way that a soul can thrive when it is hurried. And nobody will come along and unhurry your soul for you. Nobody's going to sprink time dust over your life. You just have this one soul. And gaining the whole world will not help you if you lose it, if it disintegrates, if your little will and your thoughts and your feelings and your habits and your body and your appetite become at odds with each other and keep you separated from God. It really is true. It does not profit you to gain the whole world if you lose your soul. Caring for your soul, allowing it to flourish in God's presence and become a gift to the world around you is the primary charge that faces you before eternity. Long time ago, a man named Horatio Spafford invested most of what he had in real estate. He lived in Chicago and he lost it all in the Great Chicago Fire, destroyed his home, he had no insurance, lost his money, son had scarlet fever and died. Spafford put his wife and their four remaining daughters on a ship headed to England as he stayed behind to try to salvage the business. A few days after the ship departed, he received a telegram from his wife, saved alone. What shall I do? There had been a shipwreck. All four of their daughters perished. He quickly boarded another ship to England. And as it passed over the very same place in the ocean where his daughters had drowned, he wrote these words. When peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well with my soul. Dallas used to say, this is the most important thing that you can know about your identity. You are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. You ought to write this down, he would say. You ought to recite it in front of a mirror every day. You, this is who you are. You are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe and no person, power, or circumstance can stop that. That is the awesome gift and burden and glory of having a soul. Your soul will live forever and you are the keeper of your soul.